In the summer of 2004, 89-year-old Edward Kolga returned to his native Estonia to retrace and revisit key locations in a dark odyssey that began in 1941. In that year, Soviet authorities forced him from his home and family and condemned him to the misery of the Soviet Gulag. In 1918, the tiny Baltic nation of Estonia seizes independence from its Russian occupiers. Overcoming initial hardships, the new republic enjoys a time of peaceful prosperity and a cultural renaissance. After Stalin signs a non-aggression pact with Nazi Germany in 1939, 25,000 Soviet troops march across the Estonian frontier unopposed. Too small to defend itself and abandoned by Europe and America, Soviet forces annex the country within a year. Living in a small village near the coastal community of Hopsalo, Edward and his wife led a simple rural life where years of relative freedom and the slow pace of the countryside bred a life of quiet contentment. But by the summer of 1941, after two years of Soviet occupation, Fear, suspicion, and gloom overwhelm the peace and optimism of the past. Increasingly frequent Soviet repressions, grisly executions, and sudden, unexpected deportations became common occurrences across the country. The objective? To systematically overwhelm the Estonian population in an attempt to ethnically Sovietize the country. Pulitzer Prize winning author Anne Applebaum explains. Yeah, the Baltic states were disproportionately represented in the camps. And it is, it's clearly the case that during the war, um, when Stalin first invaded the Baltic states, he very much intended to Sovietize them as fast as possible. And therefore, the, the a proportion of deportees in Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia was about 25% of the population. <laughs> Politseinikud, endes politseinikud ja siis kaitsulidu ülemad, need kadusid ära. Siis oli üks restorani omanik oli aapsalus. See kadus ära ja üksikud inimigud niivisi kadusid ära. Soon, friends and relatives started to disappear. Ja onu naine kuulsid paugutamist ja ükke, kõik arvast, et venelst tulevad talus sisse. Ja mennesid tulid sealt ja võtsid nad kinni sealt. Ja, ja siis viisid vangimajas. Ja paar nädalat ilje võin midagi, siis abikaasalasti koju. Ja mene ära. Mene siit ära, ajad ära. Ja ta oli enne kuulnud veel, kui abikaasa oli mööda läinud uksest, et oli nutkud. Nuksud, kui oli Ma õppisin need piinakambrisse viidu. Ja siis tal oli, jalad olid ära põletatud, jalad alla tulid, nahk oli vära koorum. See oli põletamis tagajärel. Okas traadik olid käed, selle ta kinni sijootud. Ja kui ma jõksin, siis silmad välja torgatud ja uled ära nõigatud. Breaking the agreement between Stalin and Hitler, German forces invaded Russia in June 1941. By July, Soviet forces had retreated from southern Estonia and held their lines south of Hopsalo as German forces drove east towards Leningrad. <laughs> As the German advance paused in mid-July, 
Soviet authorities accelerated their deportation efforts and ordered a mass conscription of all Estonian males under the age of 50. Fearing for their lives, many men, including Edward, fled into the local forests and swamps. In response, local Soviet authorities formed terror battalions and applied threats of violence to force families to give up their sons and husbands. Mobilisation oli välja kuulutatud. Ja me oleme kolm päeva iljem. Kolm päeva olime metsas veel enne kui ühel ühelt olime koju. Ma tulin koju luurele sõbraga koos. Et kuulta, mis, mis kodus on sündmused ja asjad. Ja perekond oli eriti äiritud, sellepärast, et minul oli toodud isiklik käsk, kui mina mobilitsiooniga välja ei lähe, siis hävitakse perekond, tapetakse maa ja põletakse talu ära ja kõik, mili ja kõik hävitakse ära. Unable to bear the potential consequences of his desertion, Edward decided to join the other 50,000 Estonian men who would be dispersed throughout the Soviet labor camp system and became part of what Soviet leaders termed as an evacuation of resources. Siis minu südame tunne oli nii vis, et ma olen siis parem üksinda, et perekond jääks. The train station in Hopsalu, where Edward and the other local conscripts assembled, has changed very little since that warm July afternoon in 1941. <laughs> Ja siis pandi rongi peal ja hakkas ka sõitma, kui meed, et kõik juba peal, mis siin oli. Ja, ja sellel oli Eesti maal selle, selleks aegs lõpp. Arriving in Tallinn, the men boarded a waiting freight ship. Ja, ja sadamas Venelast oli teine teine poolt ust ja iga sellest tulid välja. Once at sea, Edward was able to make his way onto the decks and saw six other ships in their convoy, including two small destroyers. The passage of any ship on the Baltic in July and August of 1941 was risky. German warships and aircraft frequently targeted vessels. And later in August, after Edward's ship had returned to collect more Estonian conscripts and deportees, the ship was sunk off the coast of Estonia with over 3,000 on board. In less than 24 hours, Edward's convoy arrived at the Soviet island of Kronstadt outside of Leningrad, where the conscripts were loaded onto coal barges and set off north along the Neva River. Following the same route in the summer of 2004 that he took 60 years ago, Edward traveled northeast from Leningrad along the Great Neva River and on past the lakes and canals of northwestern Russia. Stopping briefly at a camp south of the industrial city of Cherepovitz, he and his compatriots arrived in the northern Russian city of Vologda in early September 1941. Established in 1147, Vologda's golden domes were built at the command of Ivan the Terrible. Once a candidate for the nation's capital, by the 1940s it became a gulag transport hub where prisoners were herded from various corners of the Soviet Union. In Vologda, the men were moved to a camp on the outskirts of the city. Lodged in simple wooden shacks, some were put to work building new barracks, while others, like Edward, were transported daily to a sawmill where they loaded lumber barges in the early autumn of 1941. Despite a demanding workload, the men managed at first to fill their daily work quotas. But when camp officials saw that they were being filled, they increased them. And as the daylight dwindled with the coming fall, so did the daily food rations, followed quickly by production. 
The paradox, common to most Soviet camps, created endemic malnourishment and caused Edward and the others to scrounge for food wherever they could find it. On one such occasion, despite threats of harsh punishment, Edward's hunger became so great that he secretly left the camp to a neighboring collective farm in search of any food that he could find. <laughs> With no other choice, he gathered a few cabbages, but was unaware that during his venture he was being watched by a handful of local farmers. Having never received a Red Army issue uniform, Edward's Western style clothes must have seemed foreign to any local Russian. Caught outside the camp without identification and unable to properly communicate in Russian, Edward was hauled to the local militia headquarters at the Vologda prison. The central prison, which today serves as a prison hospital, then housed local criminals, political prisoners, and deserters like Edward, who awaited either execution or transfer to distant labor camps. Inside the compound, Edward was placed in an interrogation cell where he was guarded overnight by two soldiers and later questioned by an officer. <laughs> Relieved that his venture hadn't earned the swift reprimand promised for temporary desertion by camp commanders, Edward was returned to the camp. But a few days later, he and selected others were without explanation ordered to collect their few belongings and march towards the river. Boarding a river ship, the men descended into the cabin. The ship headed northeast along the Suhona River, deeper into the Russian subarctic landscape, and further into territory colonized by prisoners of Soviet repressions. In the autumn of 1941, months after being taken from his home by Soviet forces, Edward was transported several hundred kilometers northeast from Vologda along the Suhona River. After several days of sailing, his barge moored at a wharf near the northern Russian city of Kotlas. Built almost entirely by slave labor after the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution, the city became a major transit point for the Soviet Gulag system and remained so until the 1950s. While the barbed wire fences and guard towers have since vanished, reminders of the city's disturbing past still remain. Barracks that once housed prisoners were later renovated and converted into awkward apartment blocks. 
and perhaps the most remarkable evidence of Stalin's efforts in Kotlas are its residents, many of whom are survivors and descendants of former prisoners. Their story has been researched and documented by local historian Vyacheslav Chirkin, who after the collapse of the Soviet regime, published a book about the suffering that took place in Kotlas in the 1930s and 40s. Да, он ровесник октября. А вот он. Вот. А что, он также был портовый городишко mm -hmm. небольшой, вот и как узловой, он и туда, и сюда, он на слиянии рек, э, mm -hmm. вычих да, с, с, с двиной, вот до этого места течет, малая двина называется, а с, после слияния вычих да уже э, пошла уже э, большая двина, уже на северная двина полностью. Нет, я вас подвожу к тому, значит, что их там вот, как рассказывали, всех национальностей, их всех толпой, значит, гнали, вот с Котласа отсюда, с, сходились они со всех концов Союза, опять же, видимо, и с Эстонии, и с Польши, откуда они шли там и в тюбетейках, шли там и в шляпах, как говорится, в цивильных, которые в Польше, там, в Эстонии, там, значит, этот, все их не разбирали. Доходил вот отсюда с Макарихи, да, Яринск, то только каждый четвертый, пятый. Вот, значит, э, точных справ как таковых-то ведь, ведь не велось. Они жмерли как мухи. Вот. И на лесоповале тоже они ушли, и кто? Эти умерли, вместо них гнали других, э, третий, до тех пор, пока уже источник истяк, и потом хватили, значит, брать. Для лошадей строили конюшню, а люди жили в шалашах. И также в лесу они вот приходили, ничего нету, только вот там в комендатуре, значит, барак, там или избушка какая-то, и все остальное. Первое дело делали, значит, в очередь делали конюшни, чтобы сохранить лошадей. А людей кто их считал? Никто их не считал. Их же не считали за людей. Значит, подготовлено-то ведь не было это все, а их... Гнали, 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 гнали. При всем желании здесь ни команды, ничего, ни материалов, кто им на них будет давать там строить этот. Вот. И все, вот их селили, напихали, как в бочки. Вот там даже сам этот первый секретарь их обкома, значит, писал, что, значит, теснее, чем в гробу. Вот. Так было, значит, поэтому. Значит, на меньше квадратного метра на человека, только стоя, значит, можно было. То как, в каких условиях? можно было жить, две буржуйки, это все чат, все это испарение, все, когда они спят, примерзает, и потом у них же нет, у них не постели, ничего, ни топоров не было, кто-то все захватил, кто их топить, а дрова сырые, иди в лес по снегу, набирай, кто там заботится, даже первые две-три недели котлового питания не было, ничего, чем, как ходишь -то? By 1941, numerous camps had developed in and around the Kotlas region, including Edwards. Over the last half century, not much has changed in the village where Edward arrived. The wharf and many buildings, including the local canteen, still exist. Yeah. After a short journey through a forest, they arrived at a small logging camp in the pit of a dark valley. On that cold November afternoon, none of them imagined the horrible suffering that would follow at Camp 113. <laughs> Settling in small barracks, Edward and the others were directed to cut down trees in the surrounding forests. Dressed in light summer clothing, some without the most basic footwear, the men had no choice but to work with primitive equipment in temperatures that frequently plummeted to minus 50 degrees. Sama riietus, mille kiistist päiv kodus teile läksin. Kinkat, püksit, pinsak, Ja mulla oli se ilma varukat, että vest oli ja serk. Ja Soni Mets oli pihas. Kindad ma tekin ise pilotkast see vene. See tuli mets. Ja me töötasin veel. Ja me saime siis väga halva metsa. Aga nad oksad olid maa peal. Ja siis peened ka veel latvast, et ei anud kuidagi tiu meetreid välja, et oma päevanormi täit. 
the forestry camps were among the worst camps. Um, they were difficult for prisoners because not only did you have to work in the forest all day, you had to get to the forest. You had to walk from the camp to wherever it was they were cutting wood that day. And the walks themselves could often be a mile, two miles, three miles through freezing, freezing weather, heavy snow. Um, the system in the camps was such that you were fed according to how much you worked. So you would have every day a norm. You had to cut X number of trees or you had to build X amount of road. Um, this system served well people who were peasants or people who had some physical, um, who, who, who were experienced with physical labor because they could just about keep up with the norm and they could then get fed enough to make it through the day. The people who really suffered were people who were not accustomed to physical labor and there was a kind of cycle they would fall into where they would not make the norm, they would not be fed, they would go out to work the next day hungry, they would get, they would do even less work, they would be fed even less, and eventually they would die. Overcome by cold, exhausted by heavy work, and weakened by hunger, nearly one in three men died from either exposure, starvation, or disease. Despite this, neither the Red Army nor camp directors saw any need to clothe, equip, or feed the men. Surviving the subhuman conditions at Camp 113 seemed impossible for Edward and his compatriots. Almost immediately, death, disease, and starvation became stubborn realities. What is perhaps most unsettling is that despite being requisitioned by the Red Army, the 50,000 Estonian men seemed to have been clearly designated for slave labor, selected to churn out materials to feed the Soviet war machine. Tatiana Melnik and Irina Dubrovina are regional researchers and activists. Ms. Melnik has investigated the circumstances surrounding the Estonians in the Kotlas area from recently declassified top secret Soviet documents. They met with Edward in Kotlas to help shed light on his ordeal. Значит, документы, с которыми я работала, это документы гражданские. Это не ФСБ, не КГБ, это не МВД, это не военные документы, потому что рабочие колонны, они были в ведомстве военном все-таки. Вот эти военные, которые формировали рабочие колонны, вот что они о них говорили? Эти люди не заслуживают политического доверия. Они являются реакционно настроенным элементом. Свою враждебность они выявляют во многих фактах, саботажах, разбоях, открытых нападениях на ком состав колонн, на представителей НКВД, на должностных лиц, на прочих граждан. Насчет завышенных я не знаю, но, конечно, копейки, копейки. Там надо было сколько кубометров леса напилить, чтобы получить вот, вот эти деньги на продукты питания. Что оказалось? Во-первых, мы помним, да, мобилизация была в июле. То есть все они были в легкой одежде. Там даже пишут легкие, короткие куртки, ни у кого не было рукавиц, легкая обувь на ногах. А октябрь, когда их принимают сюда, они еще все в той же самой одежде. То есть им надо было сначала заработать хотя бы на то, чтобы одеться. Это же север. Значит, они были по статусу военные. А обмундирование военное им не дали. Им обязаны были военные ведомства дать и одежду, и обувь, и полное армейское снабжение, в том числе и питание. Но так как они не использовались на действующих фронтах, значит, они поступили как статус заключенного, поступили в распоряжение гражданской организации. И военные себя сняли эту обязанность и сказали, что пусть они работают наравне с кадровыми, рабочими, которые работают в лесной промышленности. А те работали на таких условиях. Сколько заработаешь, столько еды и купишь. Поэтому конфликт получился почему? Гражданские сваливали экипировку и питание на военных, а военные на гражданских. Поэтому никто не... Никто не... Edward and other survivors describe men who died from starvation in the camps as zombies. Fed just three slices of bread per day, they descended into a trance-like state and abandoned any sense of self. Soiled and skeletal, they shuffled around the barrack until one day they simply collapsed or didn't wake up. In efforts to survive, Edward, like many others, resorted to taking food from wherever they could find it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Ja se mies kuivattas muidugi ka neid paar ja sõi tervelt osa. Ja need täksid kõhus hakkasid paisuma ja siis jäi kinni ja, ja siis sooled ja maad kuju, kus need läksid. Need torkisid kõik selle verega. Nii et mehel tuli veri siit ja sealt. Mõlemist poolt otsat ja, ja ilmsa karjumisega suri ära. Typhus, dysentery and pneumonia were also rampant at the camps. There was little medical help and those who were transported to hospital in Kotlas typically died along the way. Для него больной эстонец Сутта при перевозке из Приводина, его везли из Приводина в Котлас в больницу, не доезжая 7 километров, был выброшен из саней и оставлен на снегу. К сожалению, мне не удалось узнать, кто его выбросил. As the daily stream of mortality accelerated, teams of ailing inmates were sent to bury the dead with obvious consequences. Ja nii, et me, et kes ei käinud tööl, ja nii, et kes 300 grammi leiba sai, et need panti siis auta kaevama. Ja enne, kui see aut valmis sai, need mehed olid ise sunnud juba. Selle pärast läks see asi nii visi. Ja hoieti matmine oli lume ja liiva segu kaetud need. Ma olen kindel, kui lumi vee. After months of horrendous suffering, a military commission arrived at the camp to examine the men. Many of those men transported to Kotlas in 1941 are buried in the region's several mass grave sites. One of the area's largest is near the Kotlas city center. As thousands died during the 30s and 40s, corpses of the young and old were brought to the site from all over the region and piled wholesale into unmarked, shallow graves. Irina Dubrovina, a local historian and activist, heads Kotlas's Sovest or Conscience Society, an organization aimed at educating Russians about Soviet repressions. She describes how victims were buried at the site. Жительница Котлеса, тоже бывшая, высланная, раскулаченная, Варвара Журавель, родом с Украины. По нашим записям воспоминаний людей, присланных сюда как раскулаченные, мы насчитываем 12 национальностей. Сюда входят поляки, украинцы, русские, евреи, латыши, эстонцы, финны. Вячеслав Вот они эти трупы за шею привязывали веревкой и волокли по земле, потому что у них у самих не было сил приподнять. Они тоже были голодные. Although there are no names, nor are there any records of who is buried at the site, it's fairly certain that the journey for many of Edward's fallen comrades ended at the mass grave. Minu tunne on see, et alul, kui ma siin olin, siis ma olin, et saaks välja siit ära, 
sellest piirkonnast üldse, et ting sisse jääks. See kord ma, mul on teistmoodi tunne. Ma tunnen kaasa nendele, kes oma elu siia jätsid. Ja lihtsalt selle vaeva ja viljetsuse nelja ja haiguste tagajärjel. Ja siin surnu ajal ma olen esmakordselt ja mul on õudne tunne näha ja tunda, kuidas inimesed on mulde pantud. Mid, nii kui loomad, mis minu arvates on, mis oleks inimene, oleks inimese vääriline. Ja tolle ajal, kui ma siin olin, siis ma oli kõige rohkem piinas mind. Muidugi peale nälja oli see, et ma olin nii aladunde või mind, mind ala ennati. Ja, ja nagu ma ei oleks inimene olnud, mul võid niisuguse tunde ära, et ma olen ka inimene, ala vääristatud mind. See oli valus tunne minu ja kestas nii kauga, kui ma nendest eemale sain. One of the most difficult things to understand about the gulag is how much of it is senseless and pointless. And you know, you can look for patterns and you can look for rational explanations and it doesn't add up. After months of suffering in a Soviet forced labor camp, rumors of an imminent release came true when a Red Army Commission visited Camp 113 in the spring of 1942. Those who had endured months of starvation, disease and neglect were mostly sick and barely able to walk, including Edward, who nearly died after the men were released to an army training base in Chebarkul, east of the Urals. Siis vaevalt jaksasin ronida sinna akna juures oli selle ahju kõrval teise selle kõrgema nari peal, mis üksik nari oli seal ühe inimesel. Ronis sinna peal arvas, et seal on kõige soojem ja aknas sisega näen välja ja siis võibolla saan värske tõhku, kui tarvis on. Ja siis, kui ma kasutasin välja käiku, kui tuli oma eda, siis ma lükkasin selle kaks ust üks ühel pool teine teis. Lükkasis nii palju lahti, et ma sain oma asja ära ja et lumi tuiskas sisse. Sealt muidugi selle poole pealt, kus mis lahti oli. The long journey from Kotla southeast to the foothills of the Urals claimed the lives of many men. The train's close, unhygienic conditions created a fertile incubator for already rampant diseases. And as in the camps, the men were chronically infected with lice and other parasites. Olin meile märkus, et mul oli palavik ja ma leidsin ilm, et mul oli täieline verine kõhutõbi. Selle pärast mul oli pesu, oli verit täis ilm. See pidi olema verine kõhutõbi. Ja, ja ma olin meile märkus, et ma ei tea üldse mäleta, kunas ma näkin, kui meile mõistus oli natuke vaatas Naksast välja. Olid, kas oli mets või siis olime uuralites, kus olid suured mäed ja lubi ainult. Upon arrival at the base in Cherbakul, the men were given light uniforms and housed in large mud huts, each overcrowded with over 400 men. We had a colony there, and we had 7 kilometers to go. And the first nurk was there. But I was going to go to the house. Ja käisin seal 7 kilometrat ära, kui jõudsime mul tonnide juurde. Despite being fed, many men continued to fall victim to the diseases carried with them from the previous months. And although crude medical services were available, those men who did enter the camp hospital rarely reappeared. Ja, seal oli kõhu tühvus. Ja või jääb plekil enne soojatõpi, nagu, nagu nad rääkisid seal. Ja seal oli mehi, oli aiglas, aigla oli täis ja siis see oli naride peal, oli, ka oli veel inimest ei julgend aiglasse minna ja, ja teatada, et nendel aigus oli. Ja siis oli isegi juhus, et kus kõrgema nari peal oli, kellel oli mehel, oli verine kõhutõbi, oli siis 
tilgat tulid, verid tilgat tulid alla, need teeb latide vahelt läbi kukkusid, alla sinna teistele peha. Ja need nii kui puuriidad laotud ja siis oli väljas oli veel, kus oli see kõlakoda või see lava, kus venelased oma esindusi tegid. Seal laval oli suur riit, seal võib-olla kümme meetret pikk ja üle mehe kõrguna niisugune laipade riit oli laud. Ja siis oli külm ja lumi oli seal talve. Siis tulid mulle kaheksa teist obu rei koormat tulid vastu, millel oli laipad laudud ja kõitega kinni tehtud võib-olla 25 või 30 laipa oli see iga reebe. 18 koormat niisugust tulid mulle vastu, laiba koormat. Kuhu need viidi või mis nendega tehti, mina ei tea seda. Nii jõudne oli see suremesi asi seal. Edward and the other Estonians trained at the base until the fall of 1942, when they were ordered to the front by the Kremlin. Suffering countless casualties en route, they were transported west towards Moscow, where they were assigned to reinforce a major Red Army counteroffensive. In November 1942, after enduring months of subhuman living conditions in Soviet camps, Edward and the Estonian Red Army divisions were transported forward to support a large Soviet counteroffensive west of Moscow. After weeks of brutal fighting, Edward's division arrived at the front near the city of Veliki Luki. His battalion, decimated again by disease and hunger en route, was greeted by a barrage of German artillery. We were in Veliki Luki. When we were in Mars, there was no other place. We were in Veliki Luki. 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 But it was a place where we were in Veliki Luki. Among the chaos created by artillery, the surrounding destruction, and the constant stream of wounded, Edward recognized an opportunity to escape the horrendous cycle of suffering. Ilm oli pime ja sampus, nagu talve ilm oli see oli 21. detsembril oli see päe, kuu päe. That evening, as Soviet forces were retreating from a German counterattack, Edward's mortar platoon was ordered to the front line to defend the battalion headquarters. I was going to go to the front line and go to the staff. I was going to go to the front line. I was going to go to the front line. I was going to go to the front line. I was going to go to the front line. I was going to go to the front line. I was going to go to the front line. I was going to go to the front line. Raketti valgus räägin sama aug, kui kaks korda nii suureks läinud kui teise mõrsuga, kas mina siis olin kui. When the deafening hail of German shells reached the low, Edward became aware that his moment of opportunity had arrived. Ma pidin just välja õppama ja või seal kargama ei jooks. Aga... See meie see kuripolitik, see patar oli vang, patar ei vang, see tuli kellegi mehe, oli kinni võtnud ja püssi ära võtnud ja siis oli püss oli tema oma selgas ja tema oma automaat oli mehe selja peal. Viis tagasi sinna patamine staabi juurde ja ma mõetasin peast käis läbi, et ma laseks selle politiki maha ja päästaks selle mehe ära. Sellepärast mul oli õigus, oli lasta kõik, kes liiguvad. Aga ise mõttes, et ma ei ole kedagi tapnud ja jätsin seal tegemata ja see läks nii kui see nurga varju läks sinna selle põhjastu arju. Nii üks mees ütles mulle, et sinust ei saagi üle mini, et nii ma õppes. Samal ajal oli, et ma õppes, kuidas seda ütles. With flares and explosions illuminating the valley separating German and Soviet forces, Edward's opportunity to escape was realized. Ja panin jooksma ja see Venema ei eest on jää karju. Kolga, kus sa lähed, kolga, kui ole edagas, kolga, tule edagas. Ele ta äli kõrgu, vaid. Ma ketid lasti üles, muidugi kolgus võib. 
Tietti, että mä viskasin jotain vielä. Mä haluan oikein, että meillä muuta pärjitä, ettei ole tämä kiikimärä. Ne vaat pötkästä, että mä juoksin näitä puoli. Mä vaan juoksin vilttu, että jos saat sinne vaatalta. Ja siis kun mä kaukana läitsin, että mä soksasta on hies. Et lähemme korvaalle. Sinne on hieskästi ihmisiä, koska sitä tuikkasi. Hieskästi tuikkasta tuli yli, että tärkeä laskenta tappasi. Saksan oli vastasäännöksi. Se tuli ja kysyisikin aattisen ja patronit ja pyssi. Mä löin pyssi tämän maapelpurun. Pötsin rauha otsaista kiinni ja löin sen aivasta maan. Ja kaikki ja piskasin aukko sinne ja granaatti meille juonut. Ja kaput ja patronit. Saksan antis sigaretti ja kohja sokolaati. Kohja siis iestästä, että natukko kaukamaan sieltä tese. Mä en arvoi kyllä käy näkuus. No siellä oli voipalla täältä yksi kaksata miestä eestlästä kestöltä yli tunnut. Gathered behind the lines, the temporary relief of the large group of Estonian survivors was shattered by a massive parting volley of Soviet artillery. All around Edward, men were torn to pieces as shells fell directly upon them. Knocked unconscious by the explosions himself, Edward was critically wounded by shrapnel that ripped through his hand, shattering bones and severing veins. A few days later, Edward and the other wounded were transported to a hospital near the Latvian border. For Edward, Christmas Eve 1942 was spent under a table in a dirty, undersupplied military hospital. And despite the pains of his wounds, he slept soundly knowing that he was almost home. In March 1943, after recuperating from his wounds, Edward was bound for home. An instinct to survive and a strong will to live guided him through nearly three years of inhumane suffering and ultimately led to his escape. The thousands of Estonian men who were unable to flee with Edward at Veliki Luki were sent back to the Gulag camps where they remained until 1944. <laughs> Yksi veikki usikko on suure, suure kivi alla, raske kalli. Ja se kivi vierettäisi selle pealtel. Returning home, Edward was met with news that his wife had given birth to twin sons during his absence. He left his heavy burden of fear and adversity in Russia and was looking forward to raising his young family. But in 1944, Soviet troops returned to Estonian soil. Using terror to strike fear into Estonians and their retreating defenders, they destroyed entire Estonian cities and frightened tens of thousands of Estonians to flee to the West, including Edward and his family. Aboard a small boat, they crossed the stormy Baltic Sea in the late summer of 1944 to seek refuge in Sweden. Worried that they weren't completely safe from Soviet reprisals, they immigrated to Canada in 1952 and settled in Toronto, where Edward continues to live today. Although the scars left by his ordeal will last forever, so shall the memories of watching his family blossom for four generations. They joined Edward at his birthplace from across Canada and Estonia in the summer of 2004 to celebrate a homecoming at a place, had he not been driven from 60 years earlier, he would have called home. In 1991, Estonia reclaimed independence. The country, the people, and family members that Edward left behind in 1944 have spent the past decades successfully recovering from years of destructive Soviet economic policies and the deliberate and brutal efforts to ethnically Sovietize the country. Ja nyt on sellaiset 63 maastat, kun jälleen aloittaisi. Ja sellaiset 
Tatpörkyssä. Se peristi kaen. <tos>